from the jungles of South America, is this an unknown ape? In the forests of the Congo, how huge was this snake which rose up and menaced a helicopter? In Mozambique, could this be an unknown species of big cat? In the Pacific, did this man see the legendary dragon of New Guinea? Did the mammoth and the supposedly extinct creatures of the Ice Age really all die out? Mysteries from the Files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he contemplates the mysteries of this and other worlds. Even in this small island, there are reports of strange animals not yet positively identified. The horned jackal and the devil bird with its hideous strangled shriek. Yet this jungle, even though it stretches as far as the eye can see, is nothing compared with the forests which cover much of Africa and South America. There's room for a whole zoo full of unknown animals there. And looking at this, I'm reminded of a riddle posed by an old philosopher. What is the most cunning of all the animals? That which no man has yet seen. In downtown Chicago, the university's professor of biology on a shopping expedition. Well, what is all of this you have? Well, a jungle machete, a jungle hammock, some medical supplies for the tropics, and a backpack. Where are you off to with it? Well, you may not believe this. We're off to Africa to look for dinosaurs. For it's in the Congo that Professor Roy Mackle and his colleague, explorer James Powell, really believe, from many reports, that there may exist a living dinosaur, or something like it. The animal is described as being as big as an elephant, or at least as big as a hippopotamus. It has a long head and neck and a long tail. It, is, uh, it has feet that are like a hippopotamus, but it has three claws on each of these feet. Every kind of animal uh, that we can think of that is alive today doesn't fit this picture. The closest uh, it, it comes to, and amazing as this may seem, is a dinosaur that is extinct perhaps 65 to 70 million years. It does have an almost perfect resemblance to uh, certain types of dinosaurs, particularly the three-clawed footprint. That is, that's almost the trademark of certain long-necked dinosaurs. What really got me onto this was in 1976, I had a grant from the Explorers Club in New York to study rainforest crocodiles in the Gabon, which is a country immediately to the west of Congo. And since I had read about these reports, I decided to see if I could come across any similar information. So among the Fang tribesmen, I tried a little, you might say, flashcard test. I first of all showed them pictures of five animals which are reasonably common in the Gabon jungles. And in each case I would say, Do you, can you recognize this animal? What is it? He says, sure, of course, that's an elephant, that's a gorilla, that's a leopard, etc. These things live around here in the jungle, we know them. Then just as a control test, I showed him a picture of a bear. Now there are no bear in Africa, so far as we know. And I said, do you know that animal? He said, no, we've never seen this, that, that animal not live around here. Then, just matter of factly, I showed him this. It's a picture of a Diplodocus from a children's book on dinosaurs. I said, do you know that animal? And in several different villages, representing at least two different cultural groups, I would get consistent answers. Yes, that's the Nyamala. We know that animal. It lives back in the deep lakes, deep in the jungles. Well, the evidence is strong enough that there seems to be some strange animal in this Congo. And if it would be, if it's a dinosaur, it would may be interesting enough for us to leave Chicago, the bright lights, the ghost of Mayor Daly, 
and go to the Congo. Thus inspired, Chicago's Congo Expedition 1980 equips itself for the unknown. Well, since the hammock works, James, I think I'll try on this mosquito hat. It, it won't keep out any mosquitoes, but let's see if it keeps out the snowflakes today. It feels warmer already. I don't feel any snowflakes, so it must work on mosquitoes, too. Somehow it doesn't look like the picture, does it? Well, that may sound a little crazy, and later we'll see what happened to them. But remember that until quite recently, people refused to believe in the mountain gorilla, the okapi, the Komodo dragon. They were all discovered in this century. Even the pandas, a recent arrival. It was literally pandemonium when San Francisco gave an all-American welcome to a real VIP, a very important panda. Baby Su Lin is the first giant panda to be brought to captivity. Ah, now it's tea time with Mrs. Ruth Harkness. During a grueling expedition in China, she found Su Lin crying in a hollow tree. But ever seen a happier panda than this? The Okapi was dismissed as a fantasy of the pygmies, the mountain gorilla too, until the first specimens were killed. Who would believe the current stories of a saber-toothed killer loose even now in the Australian bush if we didn't have evidence on film that the ferocious Tasmanian tiger, this is the last one known, was still alive in Hobart Zoo in 1933. Snakes that can swallow a donkey look like Swiss Family Robinson fiction, except we do have eyewitnesses and even photographs. This giant anaconda was killed on the Amazon. According to a Rio paper, it was 130 feet long. This one was dispatched on the banks of the Mogiachu River in the interior of Brazil. When this snake, allegedly 115 feet in length, emerged from the river Oyapok, the militia were called out to machine gun it. But it was in Africa, the Congo, that an undoubtedly monstrous specimen appeared to confront this Belgian helicopter pilot, Remy van Leerde, as he returned from a mission in 1959. As soon as we had the camera on board, I decided to make several passes over the hole where the snake was in, in able to let the man take a picture of it. And I made certainly between four and six passes right over the hole where the snake was in. By then I was already flying for 25 years, so I have a very good experience of uh, measuring things. And I would say the snake I saw there was close to 50 foot, close to 50 feet. I don't know, you say 50 foot or 50 feet, but very close to, certainly. And it was moving inside the hole and looking very dark green, deep green, brown, with his belly white. Now when I came down on that snake in his hole, and I would say at about 25, 30 foot up, the snake raised up by about, I would say, 10 foot. And I could very clearly and closely see the head, which was looking, and I could not make a better comparison as with a very large horse, with big, very, very big jaws, looking triangular. And you're just standing up like there to me, and I, I feel and I'm convinced if, it, if, it, if I had been in its range, it would have struck at me, it would have been striking me, and yet, I would say it was certainly at least, at least on the very two foot wide and three foot long. It could have easily eaten up a man. This is one of those rare cases where we have an expert witness and an excellent photograph. Analysis of the ground features suggests that this animal was indeed at least 40 feet long. So monstrous snakes do exist. On the other hand, there's been a reward out for at least 60 years initiated by Theodore Roosevelt, now worth $15,000, for any snake over 30 feet long, and no one has yet claimed it. Another controversial animal for which an excellent photograph exists is Lois's monkey. It was 1920 when from the Maracaibo jungle of Venezuela, these four gaunt and desperate figures emerged, the last remnants of a 20-strong expedition of Europeans 
who set off up the Rio Catatumbo three years before. All the rest had died, victims of fever or of the poisoned arrows of the Motoloni Indians. But one of them, geologist Dr. Francis Delois, still had with him one extraordinary picture, which was to divide the zoological world for 50 years. Could it really be an unknown ape? Yes, said Georges Montandon, France's most eminent zoologist. And he christened it Amer Anthropoides Loisi, Loisi's ape, though no ape had ever been known in America. But his deadly rival across the channel, Sir Arthur Keith, fellow of the Royal Society, denounced the whole thing as a fraud or a nonsense. With academic scorn, he quoted Deloitte's own account in the Illustrated London News, telling of two creatures which had attacked Deloitte's party by the unorthodox means of defecating into their hands and throwing their droppings at the foe. The creature was merely a South American spider monkey, said Sir Arthur, with the tail either cut off or hidden. Dr. Montandon was not to be intimidated. He got his cousin, who worked for Standard Oil in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to send him a standard petrol tin packing case, as seen in the original photograph. Upon this, Montandon placed first a standard spider monkey, and then a standard Frenchman. Comparison seemed to make Loyce's ape well over four feet tall. For Montandon, it was convincing proof. Since that day, no further evidence of a great ape has emerged from South America to vindicate Dr. Montandon or destroy theories of a hoax. But the question remains, why should a Swiss geologist, not much interested in zoology, his companions dying or being murdered all around him, be bothered to fake a picture? For that reason, if for no other, Lois's ape remains a mystery. But the mystery of the King Cheetah, for 50 years the obsession of white hunters in southern Africa, does now seem near a solution. Paul and Lena Botriel sold everything they had, even their house, in order to pursue the legend of a beast, ferocious and striped, more like a tiger, which ran with the cheetahs. The normal cheetah we've known of for 5,000 years, and they've been absolutely identical. The, um, Kubla Khan had a thousand in his kennels and many of these great princes and kings have had paintings and wall edgings done and they've all shown the cheetah as we know, the normal spotted cheetah used for hunting and there's been no difference for, for 5,000 years and suddenly in the last 50 years we've come up with a cheetah which has, has these stripes and is completely different. There are some 26 skins and as I say, everyone is absolutely standard. Stripes here, and the final part of the towel being ringed as with the tiger, which is a striped cat. The Botriels hired a balloon to search silently over the bush, until on the Mozambique border, they cornered their prey. And it was finally in Kruger Park that we found a live king cheetah that had been there for a number of years, and no one had really known about it photographed it and filmed it. This is the only known film of the striped king cheetah, running here with ordinary spotted cheetahs. The theories are that it could be a hybrid, or alternatively, it's a mutation, being uh, a strange pattern thrown up once in every few generations. Or thirdly, a species which in fact is avoided man and is living in the area of Rhodesia, Mozambique, South Africa, Mozambique. We could find a completely different species of animal, we don't know, and that in itself is enough to fight for and try and achieve. What may be a baby version of the legendary New Guinea dragon has also been filmed. It is said to kill dogs and wallabies and to grow to 20, 30, even 40 feet. 
In 1979, a six-foot specimen was shot near the River Fly, and naturalist Ian Redmond determined to look for a full-grown dragon. We were staking out water holes because uh, the lizard has to come for water every day, and some of the water holes are in a creek bed, um, so you're below the level of the forest floor in a creek bed by a pool. And one day, there were two of us, um, a few hundred yards apart. I was sitting by one uh, pool and another chap by another pool. And I'd been sitting there for several hours, and nothing happened. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I heard these, these footsteps. Um, it's, it's a forest floor, so there's lots of dry leaves on the floor. This is quiet, softly scrunching of dry leaves. Now, if you hear a, a lizard moving through the forest, it's a scurrying sound. It doesn't sound like footsteps. And I thought it must be as the, the other chap coming over, whether it was um, playing about and trying to sneak up on me. I didn't know, but it sounded very stealthy. So I'm sitting down there, and I hear this coming up behind me. And obviously, you decide at some point you've got to have a look. So as they were getting closer, I thought, well, person or animal, I'm going to see what it is. So I slowly sat up and looked around. And about 10 feet away, I, my eyes were about on the level of the bank. About 10 feet away, there was a log. And just over the log, is this great lizard head. Now, I couldn't see the whole body, but I could see that the head and shoulders were a lot, lot bigger than the one which had been shot. So I went down for my camera again, and as I went down to get my camera, the lizard moved away. But the hunt for another of the world's tantalizing missing creatures has help from all the latest gear that Japanese technology can muster. These Japanese are in Fjordland, in the far southwest of New Zealand, looking for the largest bird that ever lived, the 12-foot-high moa. Excavations all over South Island have produced the massive bones of the moa. Flocks of their skeletons dominate New Zealand's museums. The moa certainly seems to have been seen as late as 1860, and one witness, Mrs. Alice Mackenzie, said she saw one on the sand at Martins Bay in 1883. And it took no notice to me when I came near it. And I got nearer and nearer until I sat down on the sand behind it. And uh, it was a bluish color, just a faded bluish gray color. <laughs> From the structure of the neck and head bones, and with the help of a computer, the Japanese have ingeniously constructed what they believe may have been the call of the moa. Armed with the tape and stories that the call has indeed been heard in recent times, they set off into the forest, hoping for, yet perhaps fearing, a response from a bird that was supposedly able to split a man's skull with its beak or kill him with a kick. Sadly, there was no reply. The most puzzling of all the stories of missing animals comes from the snowy regions of Siberia, the disappearance of the great hairy mammoth. Professor Vereshagin has been on the trail of the Siberian mammoth for 40 years. When I was camping beside the river in Digirka in Yakutia, it seemed to me that at any moment from out of the dense undergrowth, the head of a mammoth with its hairy trunk might appear and wander into one of the clearings among the valleys. It is ideal mammoth country. On expeditions to Yakutia in the far north of Siberia, Professor Vereshagin and other Soviet scientists have found the tusks and bones of hundreds of thousands of mammoths, which seem to have died in some sudden catastrophe. But back in Leningrad, Professor Vereshagin does have one of the remarkable specimens 
which just occasionally emerge from the frozen soil of the tundra. A whole mammoth, fresh frozen for 10,000 years. This is the Berasovka mammoth, just as it was found having fallen down a ravine and been asphyxiated. Its pelvis was broken, and in its mouth there was still a piece of food, a clump of grass which had not yet been chewed. There have always been tales that mammoths still live in Siberia. And then, in 1977, some Soviet gold miners found a baby mammoth in almost perfect condition. Amid great excitement, it was brought back to the Leningrad Museum. But Professor Vereshagin is sure it died at least 10,000 years ago. The mother was killed by hunters. This baby was wounded by a spear in the right leg. It managed to get away, but died of starvation. But the discovery of the baby mammoth has produced a possibility even more exotic than the thought that the mammoth could be still alive. Next time a mammoth is found, Russian scientists are going to take some of its frozen body cells and try to clone it. That is, grow, as is now theoretically possible, a new living mammoth from the cells of a body dead but preserved for 10,000 years. Meanwhile, in the winter gloom of Kennedy Airport, the two intrepid dinosaur hunters return from their quest in the Congo. This expedition into the Congo was the most difficult thing that we've ever done, but it was well worth it. It was both the best and the worst that I've been on. In the sense, it was the worst in terms of the difficulties encountered, but it was it's the most exciting in the results of any of the African things I've been on. I remember walking walking through muck, slipping into slime up to my ankles, up to my waist at times. I remember the complete exhaustion every half an hour. When you couldn't get another breath of fresh air, you couldn't take another step. We were looking for eyewitness observers, and we gradually began to zero in on the geographical part of this area where eyewitness uh, observers were concentrated. And using that technique, we were able to come to the center of the reports, to, to a place where actually the animals are, are alleged to be. They told us about how, uh, about 1959, three of these animals, possibly two, had be, been coming into Lac Telly, and this had disturbed the fishing of the pygmies. So the pygmies decided they're going to stop this and started to drive stakes in across the opening into the lake. This prevented the animals from coming in, but one was in, while it was attempting to get through the stakes, was speared by the pygmies. They proceeded to kill the animal and cut it up into slices. They, the report from the, from the observer was that it took forever because of the long tail and the long neck. They described it as being about 30 feet long with a head and neck two to three meters long, some six to nine feet, looking much like a large snake but attached to a thick body. What was maddening about it was that with Adipena, we were, I would say, about 25 airline miles from Loch Tele. Were, which is one of the places where there might conceivably still be living specimens of this creature. We were unable to reach the lake because it would have taken from two to three days to get into the lake, a comparable amount of time to march out, and we would have wanted to stay, you know, some time at the lake. And we would not have had time to get out of the country before our visas expired. As we went along and gathered this information, I became more and more convinced that we are dealing with a real animal perhaps extinct in a very recent past, but still a real animal. Yet if we believe what the Congolese and the pygmies told us, the animals are still alive today in certain parts of the Bai River, which is a tributary of the Lekwala, perhaps even in the Lekwala, and perhaps Lake Telly. We conclude that there is indeed a real animal, uh, and that this animal is a f species which is unknown to science in a living form. So this case remains not proven. But if our exhausted heroes had been able to get their visas extended, they might have found what they were looking for. I think we've given enough evidence to suggest that very large, strange, 
and possibly amazing creatures may still exist in the remote places of this world. But while they're protected by jungles and swamps and various African bureaucracies, they may be safe from detection for a long time to come. Next week, the star of Bethlehem and the canals of Mars. <laughs>